Good morning. morning. I guess somebody's short singing today. Got to get that ready. (laughs) Welcome to Mount Olive Baptist Church this morning. We are glad you're here with us. Um, If you can look at the back of your bulletins, we have a couple of announcements. Uh, Today will be deacon elections, so you have a list of potential candidates down there on the uh, election. You can read through that list and vote according to your conscience. Also, we have Mature Living magazines ready to be picked up in the fellowship hall. Please see Josh Connor or Suzanne Jones to volunteer with the Children's Church or the nursery. As I announced last week, we are postponing our VBS at this time. Uh, The building is being turned over to us right now, technically, so we are starting to move things into the building this week. So uh, if you don't want to clap about that, I can say amen at least. It's been a long time since I've been back in that office and I feel like the fellowship hall is my office, to be honest with you. So I'm really looking forward to it and I hope you are. And because of that, I get to make an announcement I never thought I'd get to make before. What's that? To, you can use the bathrooms now. Um, <laughs> so, so right behind us, we have brand new restrooms for men and women. Since the building's been turned over to us, you are allowed to use it. Um, the doors in between are going to be unlocked at this time for people to come uh, back and forth. But uh, So if you need to use it, you don't have to walk all the way over there now. And uh, also, if you need to change a diaper or something, there's stations in there set up as well. Yes? Any, anything? Okay. Um, We are nominating positions for next year. I've had several of y'all reach out to me, so I appreciate that. If there's uh, any kind of service you'd like to provide for the church, maybe you want to work in the nursery or children's church, or maybe there's something that you just are passionate about that you'd like to serve in, please let either myself or... uh, Please either let myself or or Joe know, and, and we'll make sure to talk to you and see if we can find a position for you to serve in. Also... We need to wish congratulations to Ms. Frances Williams. She's Mount Olive's oldest living church member, and she will turn 101 on Monday, July 26. So, we just need to thank the Lord for that. If you can look at your prayer list. Well, I was going to say Miss uh, Nancy and, and Lisa Scott prayer, but they're, right, they're, they're sitting right there. We can pray for them even if they're at church, y'all. I don't know if you know that, but uh, we just want to thank publicly. She asked me to thank uh, Joe, Renee, Denise, and Philip for helping them. She took a fall this past week and had to get some stitches. So just be in prayer for her recovery and uh, thank the Lord that she's here with us this morning. Please continue to be in prayer for, for looking for a new association leader. Um, If you don't know, there's a lot of good and there's a lot of damage that an association leader can do. So just be in prayer for that search and the search committee. Uh, Also, today for deacon elections, I mean, there's no better time like the present to say a prayer for that, that God's will would be done and his purposes would be accomplished. Um, We can almost say we can take off church renovations because God's uh, finished uh, most of the renovations. So (laughs) we're really, really happy and pleased about that. Um, also, I spoke with Joseph this week after his treatments. He's doing fairly well, you know, a little bit drained from everything he's gone through, but please continue to pray for him. Um, Dan as well has uh, had a scan and gotten some pretty good news. I-, I say no bad news is good news. That's the way I look at it. So we want to praise God for that. Continue to be in prayer for Dan and, of course, for Ray Fuller and Peggy Curl and everybody else on our list here this morning. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, y'all. Lord God. We just ask you, Father, to lead our worship service this morning. We ask that no spirit but the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth would be here with us. We ask that you would speak to us through the music, God, through the tithes and offerings, and God, through the sermon. Lord, we also pray that your plans and your purposes would be accomplished through the deacon elections. We give those elections over to you, Lord. We know that a lot of folks have already turned in their votes and it's a process. And so, God, we give you that process. And we thank you that we can trust you to lead our church and our congregation. And so, God, we just thank you for all the work that you're doing in our church. We celebrate you for that and we ask that you'd lead us as we try to worship you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you'd turn with me in your hymnals to hymn number 36, Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Stand with me, please.
Well, good morning. As we prepare our hearts for worship this morning, we're reading from Psalm 40, verses 1 to 4. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 4. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go, who go astray after a lie. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for all you've done for us, for the many blessings you've given us, more than we could ever know, Lord, and just we're just so thankful for that. And Lord, help us to always seek you, to seek you above all else, to wait for you when we go through trials, when we go through tribulations, to remain faithful even when it may be easy for us to be unfaithful, to turn away. Lord, just help us and give us the strength to know that you're always there for us and not to turn away to the wisdom of the world or to men who try to pull us away, Lord, but to help us to draw closer to you, to seek out counsel from wise, men, godly men who will draw us back to you no matter what we're going through. And just be with Josh and give him the words that we need to hear that we may go out differently today than what we came in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. No surprise that I'm the short one for the mic. <laughs> I, I picked out a song that I would been wanting to sing because it spoke to my heart, and I hope that it will speak to your heart too. You know, there's times when we all probably have been through some times in our life that things that happen that we don't understand, but we know who holds tomorrow. And we know that the Lord's going to carry us through if you believe in Him. So just listen to the words of this song, The Anchor Holds. Mm -hmm. 
I have journeyed through the long dark night out on the open sea by faith alone sight unknown and yet his eyes were watching me the anchor holds though the ship is battered the anchor holds though the sails are torn I have fallen on my knees as I faced that raging sea Though the ship is battered, the anchor holds. Though the sails are torn, I have fallen on my knees as I face.
Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. We'll be looking at the whole book, jumping around a little bit. So this is going to be the last in our Minor Prophets series. So each week we looked at a prophet in their message from God. So this morning we'll look at the first six or five, five or six verses here as an introduction to the book. Malachi chapter 1. Beginning in verse 1. The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. If Edom says we are scattered, but we will rebuild the ruins, the Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down. And they will be called the wicked country and the people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this and you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. Some of you in here may have visited Yellowstone National Park. I haven't. I've just looked at the pictures. But if there's one thing that we've heard of, whether we visited there or not, it's a geyser called Old Faithful. And it's called Old Faithful because you can set your watch to how faithfully it erupts with boiling water almost at any season of the year. At 65 minutes, it erupts. You know, God's a lot like that geyser. He's faithful, he's consistent, and he's dependable. And no matter what we have done or how we might respond, God always stands ready to receive us. And here today at the end of our Minor Prophets series, God is giving us one more faithful word for his people. Now the context is the temple has finally been rebuilt, kind of like our renovation project, y'all. The people were obedient, but the Messiah has still not come. People are discouraged because they're wondering when Jesus is going to show up. They're uncertain about what this means for their future. But Malachi calls out the faithlessness of the people and the faithfulness of God. First thing we see he says is he talks about faithless pastors. Faithless pastors. Now, a faithless pastor is someone who is immoral or faithless. A man who uses his power or authority to abuse, manipulate, or control others. They either neglect people and through their inaction harm them, or they attempt to control them through their own manipulation and actions themselves. St. Francis of Assisi was once working in a garden at his monastery. And another monk came up to him and he said, Francis, if you knew you were going to die today, how differently would you live your life? And Francis sat there in the garden, like many of you do, and he looked up. And he said, I don't think I would do anything different. He said, I would keep working in the garden. I would wash the dishes. I would tend to my duties. You know, finding somebody like that who's a faithful pastor is sometimes easier said than done. Faithfulness in ministry is a difficult thing for you to find. And today this section is about the faithlessness of the priests of Israel. But I want you to think about this. Don't just apply it to priests and pastors. But think about all church leaders. Deacons, staff members, and me. When you think about this list. So the list starts in Malachi verse 6 to 11 of chapter 1. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I'm a father, where is my honor? And if I'm a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. But you offer blind animals and sacrifice. Is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept it or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? And now, entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. 
With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you, says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. For I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. For from the rising of the sun to the setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name, a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So the sin of the priests is that they're accepting tainted worship. They're letting blind, lame, and sick animals be sacrificed for God. And, and God says, you don't pay your taxes like that. Try to pay your taxes like that and see what happens. But you try to worship God that way. You beg God to bless you. Meanwhile, you're giving God your leftovers. Doesn't anyone care about worshiping me in the right way? I'm not going to accept your worship. This has to change. You're offering me profane worship that has been polluted, and I despise it, and I don't accept it. You're bringing me dead animals, sick animals, disabled animals, and I'm cursing you for this. The sin of the priest is that they not only accept this as worship, but they bless the people who bring it in as worship. They're blessing unholy, broken worship practices that do not honor God. They're disobedient to what God told them to give and how to give it, and the priests just accept it. In other words, the church leaders are blessing and accepting the wrong kind of worship from their people. For good or for bad, I've preached in a lot of Baptist churches in my life, y'all. And there's some things that you see across the board that are the same. And there's some things that are very different. And what one person might call very traditional in one church, another church has never even heard of. But for some reason, a lot of churches that I've preached at in Louisiana have this tradition. And they'll gather together in the morning before the service, the deacons. And they'll pray for the service, and the pastor will be there with them. And I've seen it done two ways. I've seen it done ten minutes before the service starts. They kind of have almost like a parade where the deacons get up and they go and they say, Hey, pastor, stop talking to that new member. Come over here. It's time to pray. And they kind of make sure everybody sees them walk out of the room and pray. And then I've seen it done another way where 30, 45 minutes before the service even starts, the deacons show up early and they pray and they set the stage for what's coming later on. And I've seen churches where the pastor tried to change that because he felt like it was too much of a show. Because Sunday might be the only day he sees some of those church people, and an extra 10 minutes would go a long way. Did the deacons and the church leaders support it or not? I've seen it go both ways. But what's the point? Do our worship practices honor God, or are they just part of our tradition? Are we allowing tainted worship practices? Not only did God warn us about faithless pastors, but he also warned us of faithless marriages. Now, a faithless marriage can be faithless in two ways. First, they're marrying people who weren't believers. This is not a racial problem, as some might say, but it's a religious problem. In other words, this is not a skin problem. This is a sin problem, y'all. Second, they're divorcing their wives for unjust causes. Now, remember, in those days, women couldn't own property. They couldn't have jobs, hardly. Their only recourse was to either go to a life of prostitution, remarry, or return back to home. And they're literally being abandoned to fend for themselves in a world where their options are severely limited. So Malachi chapter 2, verse 11 says this. Chapter 2, verse 11. Judah has been faithless and abomination has been committed in Israel and Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the sanctuary of the Lord which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. So they're marrying foreign gods. What does that mean? Well, what happened is they're marrying women who are from a different background. They're marrying women who have different religious practices. And those religious practices are impacting their livelihood and the way that they live their lives. And so, in other words, their religious devotion is impacted by their family life. And anytime there's a marriage between people of two different faiths, they often end up as atheists or non-religious. In fact, 39% of new marriages in America today are between people of different religious backgrounds. And some people may say, why don't we have more young folks in church and why don't we have more children in church? It's because we have failed to do a good job telling people that it is not okay for you to marry someone of a different religion. 
The Bible could not be more clear about this. In fact, if you marry someone of a different religion, you are being faithless to God. I knew a worship leader once who was an incredible worship leader. I mean, he was so charismatic. He had dark, long hair. I think he was about 6'5". He played Jesus in the school plays. That's, that's how attractive this guy was. And, and he was great at performing music in front of people. But he wasn't the best worship leader, you know? And I, through some weird circumstances, ended up becoming friends with him. And he came to me advice about a situation. And I found out that he had been sleeping with all his girlfriends. And, and he wasn't married to him, but yet he was a worship leader. And he had to sort of make a decision as I was talking to him. I said, you can't love God and be in worshipful and these women in this way. I was like, you need to either marry one of these women or you need to get divorced from God. He's not a worship leader anymore. As he made his choice. Now he's married and he has children. and He's been married for a number of years. But in those days, he made a decision about what he cared more about. Living life the way he wanted to, doing what he wanted to do, or leading people in the worship of God. Because what people don't want to admit these days is that the way you live your family life impacts your worship. It's easy for physical attraction, chemistry, and late night conversations to become twisted into something different really quickly. And just like this man I told you in the story, the people of Israel let their sexual desires get in the way of their worship practices. But not only that, look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 13 to 16. Malachi chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. And this second thing you do, God's not finished, but he's, he's got points. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. But you say... Why does he not? Because the Lord has witnessed between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. Did he not make them one with a portion of the Spirit in their union? And what was the one God seeking? Godly offspring. So guard yourselves in your spirit and let none of you be faithless to the wife of your youth. For the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. What does that mean? God says this. You are praying and you're crying and you are filling up my altar with your tears. But you are faithless to your woman at home. And your children are faithless as a result. And then he says, not only do you not love your wife, but you're doing the opposite of love. You're divorcing her. For the man does not love his wife, but he divorces her. And listen, except in real cases of a spousal abandonment, infidelity, or abuse, divorce is always the opposite of love. I mean, it's rare that it's the most loving thing to do. That's all, that's all I'm saying. There's a person I met in the military. I think I mentioned him one time before, but we used to joke when I was in Germany and we used to say, that guy had more marriages than he had stripes. That was our joke. Now, I, when I knew him, he had at least five or six stripes, y'all. Okay? But what I didn't tell you is he used to be a trainer at the tech school. In other words, he used to work with young women all day. And he was specifically and deliberately, let's just say, moved away from that kind of work. Because he didn't treat the women with respect. They were trying to protect these young women because he was, he was serially getting into relationships with them, marrying them, and then three, four years later, he was training them in for a new model. That's what he was doing, and his military career was impacted. That's the worst kind of treatment for wives and husbands. And unfortunately, it's very easy for us to apply this to our day. Only in 21st century living, women can do it to men and men can do it to women. So in some ways, the problem is twice as bad because we can do it to each other equally. We get married, we get tired of each other, and we trade each other in for a newer model. And so the question you have to ask yourselves is, am I in a faithful marriage or am I in a faithless marriage? And remember that no matter where you fall in those categories, God has grace, deliverance, and perseverance for us.
But not only does God warn us of faithless marriages, but he also warns us of faithless holiness. Now you might say to yourself, what does it mean to be holy? Well, what is holy, y'all? The Bible is called the Holy Bible. The Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. But what makes it holy? God makes it holy. To be holy is to be made different. To be set apart. I love that old King James, excuse me, the old King James term, a particular people, a peculiar people. Y'all are different. At least you're supposed to be. That's what he's saying. Holiness is ignored far too often in our churches. And God says through the prophet Malachi that you need to pursue holiness. Think about it like this. Whenever you go in for a surgery, I've had knee surgery before, but maybe you've had more surgeries. Maybe dental surgery. Maybe you've had your eye examined before. <laughs> now, we'd like to hope that any doctor who's doing any kind of surgery or procedure or examination to us, when they come to that table of their tools, and if they see dirt or mud or dried blood on it, they discard it, right? They discard it. They don't, I don't want that in my body. And they don't want to use it because it's going to spread infection. Why don't they use it? Because it's unclean. And it's not worthy of being used in that way. Listen, to be used in surgery, it needs to be thoroughly cleansed, purified, and undefiled in order to be useful. And listen, is this not the same way that our Christian faith should be? Do we not need to be purified and, and cleansed and sanctified by God's Holy Spirit and transformed and renewed and changed daily? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. And God has not told us this once or twice in the Minor Prophets series. He has sprinkled the breadcrumbs of this truth in every sermon we have looked at. Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 to 3 says this, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he's coming, says the Lord. But who, listen, but who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi. And refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. God says, I'm going to purify the pastors. But let's apply this to everybody, y'all. He says, the day of the Lord is coming. Who is ready for it? Who can endure it? He says, I'm going to refine you of your sin. I'm going to purify you. I'm going to make you holy. But you have got to seek him for this holiness. You've got to confess your sins and turn away from that sinful lifestyle and embrace that holiness. And you might say to yourself, oh, I don't sin that much. I'm not that bad of a person. But God wants to purify you, renew you, restore you, transform you into a new creation. One that looks like his character and not your character. Do you know how refining fire for gold and silver works? As the gold is refined in the fire... The impurities float to the surface. And then the refiner can take it out of the fire and set it down and all the nasty impurities solidify on the surface of the gold. So that's one way you can refine gold. Another way is while it's still in its liquid state, you take a tool and you scoop out that imperfection and you rid that gold of its impurity. Now many of you say, I'm struggling with the same thing that I've always struggled with. And that's because once a week or twice a week or every other day you come to the Lord and you say, Lord, rid me of this problem. And God says, okay, I want you to hop in the fire. And you hop in that fire. And God begins to work on you and convict you and burn you. And all those impurities come to the surface. And you say, thank you, sir. That's good enough. And you leave. And you keep living your same lifestyle unchanged. God wants to scoop out that garbage and rid it from your system. That's why you're still experiencing some of those same struggles and difficulties. But sometimes we can't see that sin because it's so common in our lives. 
It, it, it's so common that we don't even notice anymore. It becomes a part of our life and we become numb to it. It's like me with my glasses. I, I forget my glasses are on my face unless Judah's trying to grab them off. You know? I, for, I forget that it's there. It's like hoarders. I don't know if you've ever seen that show, Hoarders, right? But listen, somebody just doesn't wake up one day and have a house full of garbage. That's not how it works, y'all. Did you know that? That's not what happens. And what happens is somebody decides, I want to save something, right? And they go, oh, I'm just going to put this in the corner of my room. And I, I know my room is nice and clean, but I got this in the corner. And, th and then they go, ooh, I just, I just want to save some more and some more and some more and some more. And then eventually they get to a point where they have to make pathways through their own house. And their friends and their family, listen, when their friends and their family come over, they got to wear masks like y'all are wearing right now. Because that smell of animal waste and sometimes death is so thick in there. They've got stuff that's been sitting in there, falling on their animals, and they don't even remember it. And it stinks, and they can't smell it anymore. That's how our sin is. It's like when I was deployed. On my very last deployment, I went to a fob called Fob Tearing Cow. And we lived right on the other side of a berm, which is a big mound of dirt. From the, We called it the sugar ponds, y'all. But um, they smelled nasty, but they had a sweet essence to them from the chemicals they put in there, so we called them sugar ponds. Now, when you first get to a fob with sugar ponds, you smell it everywhere you go. You know? But what happens is, when you work in the sugar ponds and you smell it, right? And you're working out at the gym and you smell it. And you go home and sleep at night and you smell it. What happens? You take a shower in it and you smell it. Eventually, you don't smell it anymore. Right? In fact, you got to wash your clothes about five times when you get home to help get some of that stink out. And me and a couple of my friends threw our clothes away because they smelt so much from that tainted air. And that's what we have to do with our sin. We have to take whatever it is that's calling us to stumble and we need to rid our lives of that thing. We need to rid our lives of that issue and we need to seek to live a more purified state. It's not just that our sin is deluding us, but it's our conviction of our sin that is being deluded. When is the last time that you allowed God to convict you of your sin? Now listen, don't blame it on the sermon or the pastor or the church. Because a man or woman of God can be convicted by a bad sermon from an holy pastor and an unholy pastor. From a good church and a terrible church. You know why? Because that's the power of God's word. God's word will not return void. And it doesn't matter if I do a perfect job explaining to you or tell you the best stories or dance around here to keep you up at night, right? It doesn't matter. You know what matters? Are you allowing that word to penetrate you? Are you allowing that word to convict you? Are you allowing that word to change you? I'm just telling you, you can worship God with an off-key band, right? And you convicted of your sin by God's word alone and nothing else. But not only did God warn us of faithless holiness, but guess what? He warned us of faithless tithing. Now, throughout the Bible, it teaches us the importance of tithing. And originally, in the, in the early Old Testament, I mean, tithe literally means a tenth, okay? And that's what it was from the very early days of Abraham in Genesis. But do you know what happened? You don't have to read your Bible long to get to Deuteronomy, okay? And in the law, it was a lot more than 10%. It was more like 30%, 35%, okay? Because they were using it for three different purposes. They used it to support the priests. They used it to take care of the poor. And they used it to care for the temple. So those are the three things that they used the tithe for. In the New Testament, uh-oh, Jesus came along. And it got changed. Because it's not 10% and it's not 30% and it's not 35 or 25 or whatever. Now the Christians start holding everything in common. And I think as Americans, we react to that. I want my stuff to be my stuff and your stuff to be your stuff. That sounds like communism to me. Listen, it sounds a bit like communism to me too, but I'm just telling you what the Bible says. It says in Acts that they began to hold everything in common and that as people had need, they brought it. So it wasn't 10% or 20%. It was all that they had. And Jesus warned his followers that true devotion of God involved tithing with a social conscience. The concern for the poor and compassionate living was a part of it. 
A good friend of mine, his daughter is in her senior year of high school. And they're doing the, the college tour. That's what I call it, where they just pop up on your social media feed at a new college. And recently, they went and they visited Georgetown University. And as she's walking along, they had these banners with the, with, with the saying for the university. And, and what does it say? Well, it echoes those same words of Jesus. When you walk around and look at these banners, it says, Faith that does justice. Faith that does justice. Now, Jesus says that the right attitude for our tithe is that it takes care of the church and the community. He wants us to support justice and mercy in our local area. And part of giving to the poor and part of tithing were to be always connected to each other fundamentally. This is the context for Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 to 11. The people are not taking care of the poor. They're not taking care of the church. They're not taking care of the priests, which I don't blame them. They're not, they're not act, acting the way they should either. So Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. But you say, how shall we return? What man will rob God, yet you rob me? But you say, how have I robbed you? In your tithe and your offering, your contributions with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food. And put me to the test, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour down a blessing until there is no need. Man, I've heard this so many times in my life, y'all. But I've never heard it in my context. I've never heard it in God's context. So we need to put it for today and we need to put it for that day. We need to do both. See, God's not saying, when you tithe for me, I'm going to fundamentally always and forever take care of you. That, that's not what he says. What God says is, if you're not tithing, then you're, then you're cursed. If you're not tithing, then you're keeping a blessing from yourself. That's what you're doing. And from your family, if you're a head of household and you're doing that. So he's saying you're protecting yourself from curses by tithing. And I never heard it understood or explained to me like this. But he's saying, test me and see if I remove the curse. It's not name it, claim it. It's not if you don't tithe to God, we're just going to withhold blessings from you. But he says curses are brought into your life through withholding the tithe. And one of the easiest things you can see is as money becomes more important than people. And as money becomes more important than God, tithing checks our heart against the things that would pull against it. So the question isn't, what are you going to do when you have a lot of money? But the question is, what are you going to do now? I remember times in my life where I didn't have enough money to pay rent. And someone came and slid a check under my door. And listen, I wasn't praying, oh Lord, heaven. I wasn't praying church prayers, y'all. I'm going to be honest with you. I was yelling at God so much that I hurt my own voice. I said, I left my job and I'm running out of money. I got nothing to pay tithe with, much less rent. And a check was put under my door by my Sunday school teacher. And he saved me. See, his generosity with the poor, that was me, impacted his ability to give to God. See, it was both. Both of these things is the heart of what God's trying to teach us. And God says, if you are responsible giving the tithe to care for the church and care for the poor and care for the pastor, then I'm going to bless you so incredibly that the rest of the world is going to be shocked by it. Listen, I know preachers who don't want to preach this because they don't want to make it sound like they want to raise. But I'm saying this was the next passage I had to preach it, y'all. W.A. Criswell talks about a young man and he says, this man came to him and said, hey, I'm going to commit to give the 10%. Will you pray for me? And they began to pray for his career. And so that first week, he could afford to give $4 because that's all the 10% that he made that week. But a few years later, God had blessed him so much that he was giving $400. That's a big increase. So he called up the pastor and he said, Hey, pastor, can you see if God will let me out of this deal? Because this is a lot of money. And Chris will, without missing a beat, said... Let me check with God and see if we can get you back to that lower pay. You see, some of us want to be blessed by God, but we don't want to bless God. Some of us want God to bless us, but we don't want to be obedient. Sometimes we want God to be obedient to his word, but we don't want to be obedient to his word. And that needs to impact us. So God not only warned us of faithless tithing, but he also warned us of a faithful God. At the end of Malachi, God reminds us of the faithfulness of God. And he says this, 
Verse 5 of chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. How's that for the last words of the Old Testament? No wonder it gets a bad rap. One day I'm going to send another prophet and before I bring judgment and destruction. Before you face the great white throne of judgment, I'm going to send a part of myself down there. And it's going to impact you and it's going to change you. And the problem today is that people are so far from worshiping God, it's depressing. We have these elaborate productions with the perfect lighting, a beautiful sound system, a nice recording, and great microphones. So you don't even have to come. You can just watch from the comfort of your own home. And we need to ask ourselves a real question. Do we look any different from pagan people attending concerts or someone attending a nice self-help talk? Are we truly dedicated to him or simply getting our fire insurance in case we die soon? But we need to apply this truth. There's four truths here and there's four applications for it. Number one, give God your church leaders today and give God your pastor. Listen, I can't tell you the number of times this week that I was begging God for wisdom, for discretion, and for good decision making. So if you say, Pastor, I pray for you every day, thank you. <laughs> if you say I pray for you once a week, thank you. Uh, please keep going because I need it okay I mean I feel the weight of my inability and my own sin sometimes just like anybody else and your prayers help me get through that I'm only human just like you are and today we're electing deacons so what we need to pray today is that God would give us the wisdom to make good selections don't pick the person who's closest to you in age don't pick a person you think you can influence or manipulate and don't pick a person who's going to listen to you the most the only decision you have to make is this who do you trust with the spiritual direction of your soul and your church? That's it. Who do you trust with the spiritual direction of your soul and your church? Number two, marriages. We've got to give God our marriages. Look, some of you are the walking dead, and I'm not talking about the TV show. Some of y'all are paralyzed. There's parts of your marriage that work good, and there's other parts that work fine, and there's other parts that don't. We need to pray for our marriages. We need to pray for the marriages of Mount Olive Baptist Church. We need to pray for miraculous healing and movement in our marriages. Now, I'm going to get specific, y'all, so feel uncomfortable if you want. Pray for deep, passionate sexual expressions of the marriages in our church. Okay? Let's pray for deep, abiding, emotional intimacy in the marriages of our church. Listen, let's pray for better communication in the marriages of our church. Let's pray for better financial stability for the marriages in our church. And let's pray for better leadership in the home for the marriages of our churches. Number three, holiness. C.S. Lewis wrote a letter to an American friend of his once. And he said to her, You know, if 10% of us would care about holiness in a meaningful way, and take the Bible seriously, it would change the world. He said it would result in mass conversions and people seeing that others who know Jesus live their lives differently. And I just want to ask you these questions, okay? What would it look like in your life if you actually pursued holiness? What would it look like if our members pursued holiness and believed that it mattered? What would it change in the way we do business, in the way we prioritize spending, in the way we daily make decisions in our lives? How would it change it? And finally, the tithe. I'm sorry to tell you, you need to give God your money. I mean, that's what the Bible says. I, I don't care if it's pre or post taxes. I'm just being real with you. I don't care if it's exactly 10% or 20% or 30%. I don't care. Give generously. Give to support the poor. Give to support the church. Give to support the pastor. That's the stated biblical purpose of the tithe. So do it. We can always give more money. We can always pray and be convicted to give more money. So don't just decide what you're going to do, but pray and give as God leads you because He will tell you. So I invite you to respond this morning by giving God our church leaders. I invite you to respond this morning by giving God our marriages. I invite you to respond this morning by giving God our desire for holiness and our application of the tithe. There's a lot in this sermon for us to chew on. And as our musicians come forward, I want you to think how God might convict you to respond. Don't be like one of the people I described who's angry at anybody and everybody else but their sin. Allow God to convict you. Allow God to change you. 
Allow God to work in your life. Let's pray. Dear God, we give you our souls this morning. We do. And we ask for you to direct our church and guide it, Holy Spirit. Father God, may you move in us in a new and rich and meaningful way. We give you this next generation of leaders. And, and we thank you for the faithful work of those who have come before them. And we ask that you would bless those leaders. God, we give you our desire for holiness, our disobedience of the tithe, and our broken marriages. And we ask in Jesus' name that you would help us pick up the pieces, Lord. All these are deep and meaningful and difficult issues that weigh upon us, Father. But we give them to you this morning and ask that you would speak life and love and healing. Give us strength and perseverance to not give up on the things that you have given us to dedicate our lives to. We ask this in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.